What the hell did we just see in Canadian House of Commons as all political parties stood and cheered for Ukraine and its independence and freedom and everything, which is not a bad thing, except what about us? What about us? Where was this unity when the truckers came to Ottawa, and before they took over downtown, all they wanted to do was talk to Trudeau. But he couldn't be bothered. He doesn't talk to people he doesn't like. And then, on top of that, he called, he, he lied. He lied. Everything he called them and said about them was a simple lie. And the opposition didn't come up and you know, champion for freedom. Oh, do you know that people have been imprisoned and stuff in Russia and the protesters? Well, shit! Didn't that just happen, what, a month ago or so? Maybe two months ago? Here in Canada, that protesters were imprisoned? <clears throat> yeah, but you gotta understand here, they were breaking the law. Unlike in Russia or other places, they're just protesting for freedom. Our protesters were breaking the law. <clears throat> so today we watched two. Uh, one was a former actor, uh, Zelensky from Ukraine. He had a TV show for three years playing the president. <gasps> oh, what a coincidence. It kind of like reminds me of when Event 201 was happening just months before that pandemic struck. Oh, I tell you, the world is full of coincidences. Yeah, and Trudeau, well, he wasn't an actor. He still isn't, but he is a drama teacher. He's a drama queen, let's be honest about it. Oh, I'm a drama queen. Oh, I gotta make my hair look all pretty so I can have my pretty time. He's such a... You know, it is ridiculous what is happening to the world and how our media is brainwashing people into this shit. Ukraine was a peaceful country. In what friggin' world did they live in? You know, 2014, a coup organized in part by the United States and its Western allies. Canada was involved in that crap. And then, from then on, conflict and war, well, even before that, holy Christ. You know, you look at that documentary by Oliver Stone, you can still find it on YouTube. It's called Ukraine on Fire, and Ukraine wasn't peaceful. Oligarchs weren't good guys who walked away with billions and billions. They had organized crime running bigly throughout Ukraine with every dirty thing you can call or see or imagine. Maybe things you couldn't even imagine. And then on top of that, they had the neo-Nazis. So when you see our politicians standing up and giving standing ovations, remember, Neo-Nazis, that's something that Trudeau pointed out so eloquently when there was a guy with one flag somewhere, I don't know, maybe there were two flags, but he didn't know what the person's stand was or what, maybe it was just an idiot, probably more than likely, but Trudeau couldn't take that. He had to label all the truckers that. Anyway, before I go any further, here is Elizabeth May responding to the speech of all speeches. I now invite the House Leader of the Green Party, Ms. Elizabeth May, to say a few words. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Merci, 
President Zelensky. Thank you, President Zelensky. What an honor for me to take the floor in this extraordinary historical moment for all my dear colleagues. The Green Party is part of a green, grand green family in many countries of this world. A few days ago, I received the following letter sent by the president of Ukraine's Green Party. And I quote, We are writing to you from bomb shelters from our home Ukraine, which is mercilessly attacked and bombarded by Russian forces since that fateful day, February 24, 2022. Ukrainians are indiscriminately hit. Collateral damage amounts to total destruction of cities, many civil and social infrastructures that have no relevance to the military are destroyed. Thousands of civilians dead and injured. Millions are fleeing their homes. <sighs> Ukrainian army and civil defense volunteers have taken up arms and are fighting for the survival of Ukraine. They are successful to a great extent. But missile and bomb attacks by air are causing greatest damage. We are helpless. We have no weapons to counter air attacks. We appeal to you for support. Please urge your governments to help protect our sky by having a no-fly zone. For the sake of world peace and security, for democracy and resolution of conflicts, through peaceful means and a rules-based world order, please help Ukraine. Now, it broke my heart to write our dear colleague in Ukraine that all elected Greens around the world have come to the same conclusion that a no-fly zone will risk a wider war and even a nuclear war. We know these reasons are solid even though they ring hollow. But we must use every tool and I fear that the tools we have in front of us are inadequate to the task. President Zelensky, we do not want to let you down. We fear that we may inevitably let you down, but we will find every tool we can find. And where there aren't adequate tools, by God, let's invent them. In 1956, in the Suez Crisis, <laughs> in the crisis in Suez in 1956, not yet Prime Minister, but Lester B. Pearson, a Canadian, we are we love ourselves here in Canada, we do. But we are an insignificant country in the massive geopolitics of superpowers, but we sometimes get good ideas. Lester B. Pearson invented UN peacekeepers. We need to invent something now that's effective to stop the war, to stop Putin, to save Ukraine. We have to use every single idea, every single sinew, every muscle. We must not relent for one single second. We have seen illegal wars. I've lived long enough to see many w illegal wars based on lies in Vietnam and Afghanistan and Iraq. Too many innocent lives lost and now never again. Not one more Ukrainian child. Please, God, stop the bombs. Please, let's have a ceasefire. Please leave a pathway for Vladimir Putin to make it to a negotiating table and find a peace. How do we stop lies? We stop them with the truth. And the truth is the courage of the Ukrainian people. The truth is the courage and the unexpected reality of you, President Zelensky. An honest to God Democrat, a human being, a mensch, a man of such moral courage that the world is inspired. But we must not let you down because God knows you won't let us down. We must do more. We know this. You are, as our Prime Minister just said, a champion of democracy. May we be worthy to stand by you. May we find the ways that make it meaningful that we stand with you. Not one more lost life, please God. Not one more mother in Russia who weeps for a lost son in an immoral and illegal war. Thank the brave Russians who face jail just to go on the streets and say, stop the bombing, no more war. I close with this, President Zelensky, what I want, what I pray, and I pray for you constantly, and for Ukraine. 
What I want is that you come here in person, that we invite you and we see you here, president of a country at peace, of a free, democratic, and victorious Ukraine. Please come here so that we can hope that in your eyes we remain worthy to be called your friend. Thank you. Alarm! Alarm! New virus hits Canadian politicians, sapping their brains. Oh, they're now hollow-headed. I don't know what, but I see that woman has lost her marbles the way she's talking. You know, there's other places in the world, uh, Miss Green, that uh, there are wars happening. You know, I used to like Elizabeth May. I thought... She made sense maybe five or six years ago. But that is lost. I mean, I can't believe what came out of her mouth. And I'm not even going to torture you with Jagmeet Singh now. There's another real prize in Canada's parliament. Jagmeet, Elizabeth May, Justin Trudeau. Who will control the conservatives is the question. Well, I would place my bet on somebody from the World Economic Forum, young leaders class. It seems like that's where all of Canada's House of Commons politicians, well, not all, you know what I'm saying. A hell of a lot when Klaus Schwab can brag that more than half of Trudeau's cabinet is, what, alumni of the World Economic Forum? They're everywhere. What about Poroshenko? Well, he's a young leader, very wealthy it would appear. Mr. President, it's a pleasure to welcome you for the first time here at the annual meeting in Davos. Last April, you won the presidential elections in Ukraine in a staggering, with a staggering majority of 73%. I think this is a dream for any politician to have such a majority. Much emphasis and hope has been put into your government's ability to reform the Ukraine from within. You have let out your extensive ambitions to remake Ukraine into a dynamic market economy free of corruption. Yeah. At the same time, the Ukraine is faced with daunting challenges. And as a president, you have already had to deal with uh, the political reality in your first months of office. We are now very eager to hear from you how you see the future of Ukraine. Welcome very much, Mr. President. Really amazing how this Klaus Schwab could nab all these leaders. I mean, there's going to be a financial and Hello, other things it's behind it. It's a great pleasure to be here the first time. Uh, I'm the president of Ukraine, so I'll speak Ukrainian. But he knows how to speak English. Um, Mr. Mr. Dear Mr. Chairman, Professor Schwab, dear all, for me it's extremely really pleasant to be here at the 50th uh, session of the World Economic Forum. And uh, using this opportunity, I would like to note the projects of the Forum uh, for Ukraine, and namely scenarios of the future for Ukraine, Geneva Initiative for Ukraine, the new economic vision for Ukraine, and uh, I thank you for what has already been done, and I count on the further fruitful cooperation, the topics which are debated here in Davos. And now, back to my magic box of conspiracy theories. The more I see of this screwed up world, the more I'm believing it's not random, and that everything from the war in Ukraine between Russia, from all the outbreaks of viruses to all the other economic showdowns that are coming. I believe everything is part of a plan. 
You don't take over the world like the World Economic Forum wants to without having a plan. You know, you hear these piece of crap politicians in Canada's House of Commons talking about, oh, Zelensky, awesome, oh, 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 he's so great. In the meantime, how many cities in Canada have issues with cost? Cost where young people can't afford to buy a home, maybe even rent. Not only young, I mean, you see the shows. Food insecurity. You know, we got our very own beloved CBC showing us how to purchase uh, food that is getting close to expiration date. Now, that's fine. I've done that as a way to save money, not forced into it. But it's going to force more people into it. And you know what that's going to mean? There'll be less of that available. More people going to food banks. Every part of our lives is going down the shitter. And did Parliament talk about that today? No! It's all about Ukraine. Oh, we're going to give them money. We're going to give them weapons. When they come here, we're going to look after them. Well, Jesus Christ, I'm pretty sure Justin Trudeau's going to volunteer to go from house to house wiping Ukrainian butts after they go. You know, it's incredible. He pretty well spits on Canadians every chance he gets. But for all of this stuff, he's there. And again, World Economic Forum. So anyway, I was trying to find some stuff on, well, first of all, Zelensky. You all know that he was a actor and made his way up pretty damn good too worth over 700 million up to one and a half billion depending on who you listen to the Panama Papers came out one and a half billion offshore but we don't know we don't know because these people can transfer money around and hide it all over the place and can you imagine when you got U.S. and Canada and Australia and all these other countries on your side? Well, they're not going to make anything appear. And talking about that, I was looking up Ukrainian oligarchs. And there used to be a lot of talk about Ukrainian corruption, the Nazis, the Azov Brigade and oh, Battalion. And all these different... Go Google it now. You're going to have to really search to find, every time you Google uh, corruption and stuff, Russia, 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 Russia has, you know, we don't have any corruption in Canada, not in the United States of America. It's uh, certainly not happening in UK or France, but in uh, Russia, it's ripe with corruption. All these oligarchs, you know. It's an incredible load of crap to carry around. Anyway, I did find a couple of things, searching, 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 which is what I do with half my time now. So I'll play a little bit of that for you before I finish. A nation robbed with the help of Western banks. They use London as a safe haven. It's a kind of business, you know. We reveal how Ukraine is being robbed for a second time under the nose of the authorities. We simply didn't have confirmation. And this looks like confirmation. The proceeds go to an oligarch in hiding, a man fueling a war fought by Russian separatists in Ukraine. The president had refused to sign an agreement to bring Ukraine closer to Europe. The goal of revolution was not only striving towards the EU, the goal was also to have the fair play and the fair rules of the game, and the revolution was against corruption. For three months, Kiev's independent square became a battlefield. Over a hundred people lost their lives. And uh, there is a new, outstanding information 
news to be reported. There is a good reason why I pay so much attention at the Economic Forum to the security issue, because it is overriding for the development of the Ukrainian economy. At the same time, our philosophy is to remake our own problems into our strength. The challenges facing us, Ukrainians, got us mobilized, make us move faster, inspire to make the impossible and improbable possible. We focus and program ourselves for positive thinking, we are committed to positive tasks. What do you think is the task for the country who lost a portion of its territory and is by far not the richest in the old continent? Well, I will tell you, to be the leader of the Eastern and Central Europe. These are ambitious plans. Do you think it is impossible? Many world unicorns started with crazy ideas, a couple of employees and offices in a garage. Vladimir Zelensky is both the Ryan Seacrest and the Julia Louis-Dreyfus of Ukraine. His TV talent show, League of Laughter, regularly gets some of the highest ratings in the country. He's also been playing a sitcom version of the Ukrainian president for three seasons. But in an indicator of just how much Ukrainians appreciate the absurd, or just how desperate they are for change, Zelensky might be about to do it for real. <laughs> He's now the unlikely front-runner in this week's presidential election. It's only a few days until the presidential elections. Yes. Why are you doing this? <laughs> Why, are you Why no? Time? This is my profession. Why not? Okay. This is my profession. Many. Do you not have a campaign to be running? Yes. You're a busy man. Yes. You'll be even busier if you become president. Who knows? I don't know. I've never been there, so maybe they have Saturday and Sundays. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands took part in the Maidan revolution in 2014. Back then, protesters had high hopes, ending endemic corruption and transforming the economy. But that was five years ago. Nothing's really improved. And Ukraine is still in a war with Russia that's seen 13,000 casualties. None of what is taking place in our world today could have been predicted well, by most people. I'm sure the ones that are involved in it knew what was coming, but for most of us, the citizens who are impacted by it day by day, we couldn't have imagined this kind of crap coming from people in politics, our governments, whose job it is to look after their people. And they have absolutely screwed that away and are now enemies of the state, along with our fake, lying piece of crap media. Oh, and look, I, I, but I think that's an incredibly relevant question. Yeah. And I think DOJ, in the same way that it is uh, setting up a task force to investigate oligarchs, should look into people who are Russian propagandists and shilling for Putin. That's being, if you are a foreign asset uh, to a dictator, mm -hmm. it should be investigated. In fact, I remember when Tulsi Gabbard, mm -hmm. and I even hate that we're discussing it because I think to myself, who is this woman? Yeah. They used to arrest people for doing stuff like this. If they thought you were uh, colluding with a Russian agent, if they thought you were putting out information or taking information and handing over to Russia. Yeah. They used to actually investigate stuff like this. And I guess now, you know, there seems to be no bars and people are not being told to hate Putin. It's really hard to pick from so many, but these women of The View have got to be the stupidest or greediest MFers around. You know that uh, making five, six, seven million bucks a year 
for sitting around and chatting and influencing people's thoughts. Because there's people that listen to, oh, yeah, there used to be laws. They would be arrested for talking freely. Oh, what has happened to our country? We gotta have free speech, but only on one side. Really crazy women. That, you know, again, I'm not for censorship, but where's the fact checkers on this? Where are the fact checkers? Because if Trump says something, man, everyone is all over it. COVID misinformation, Ukrainian fake news. There's bad information everywhere. Luckily, your government are here to censor everything because you're too stupid to understand it yourself. Thank God for the government. Anyway, let's get into this misinformation and be very, very careful about this stuff as we go because, you know, I don't want to misinformation you. Do a bit of misinformation before you know it, you're a terrorist. Let's see what they're saying now. This article is by Caitlin Johnston. Kremlin-backed media outlets have been banned throughout the European Union, both on television and on apps and online platforms. Now, obviously, with the terrible war in Ukraine, with Putin's monstrous actions that are leading to the death of Ukrainian people, people the same as you and I, who have the right to live, who have the right to freedom, who have the right to sovereignty and democracy, you would think anything that we do is deemed necessary and is vital. And as long as it's leading to Ukrainian people being safe and this war being short and the best possible outcomes for Ukrainian people, any action that you take is understandable. However, I will say that, don't you think, I'll just decide for myself what propaganda is. Of course, Russia today, a state-funded Russian TV station is going to, like, um, I imagine, support opinions that are convenient for Russian agenda. But I suppose another thing you might say is Russia today might have a different perspective from Western media, which I'm sure are completely free from propagandist agenda and the way that they're sponsored and the way that they're funded and the people that sit on their boards. Yeah, you know, none of that could lead to particular perspectives being highlighted, could it? The federal government is putting pressure on social media platforms to block Russian media. Twitter, historically, the last of the major online platforms to jump on any new internet censorship escalation, is now actively minimising the number of people who see Russian media content, saying that it is reducing the content's visibility and taking steps to significantly reduce the circulation of this content on Twitter. This is why I think it's dangerous to get into this kind of simplistic, sanctimonious, pious certainty, moral certainty, and this is wrong, this is wrong, we're doing I feel that we're dealing with a complex and nuanced situation what's not complicated it's wrong that people in Ukraine are suffering it's wrong that Putin has invaded Ukraine but when it gets to controlling information man I'm not so sure that I like that because what's being established is a principle now during Russia's egregious attack on Ukraine we're gonna ban all Russian media because you might get confused, you don't know how to discern information, you're an idiot. That's basically how governments operate, right? Can you imagine a situation down the line where other forms of speech might suddenly be forbidden and censored and annexed? Because I can. Twitter is also placing warning labels on all Russia-backed media and delivering a pop-up message informing you that you are committing wrong think if you try to share or even like a post linking to such outlets on the platform. It has also placed the label Russia State Affiliated Media on every tweet made by the personal accounts of employees of those platforms baselessly giving the impression that the dissident opinions tweeted by those accounts are paid Kremlin content and not simply their own legitimate perspectives. That's shutting down any opinion coming out of Russia, including potential dissident opinions, criticisms of Russian actions. We read on my podcast Under the Skin with Yanis Varoufakis a letter from Russian citizens outright condemning Putin's imperialist actions, saying they're against it, that these are the actions taken on behalf of oligarchs, the kind of thing that any right-minded person would think about any aggressive war on ordinary people. And that kind of information, that would be badged up, as uh, Caitlin Johnston says, wrong think. Also, if you prohibit conversation, what solution is there going to be then? If you forego diplomacy, communication, the possibility of common ground being found, the not monstering and monstifying 
people from other territories, accepting that there are good and bad people everywhere, that the line between good and bad, as the Russian writer Solzhenitsyn said, the line between good and evil runs not between nations or religions and creeds, but through every human heart. By not acknowledging your own fallibility and your own flaws, by simplifying arguments to good and bad, you prevent diplomatic, convivial, collegiate solutions and require that there is an ongoing conflict because there's no bloody intercommunication. Even Solzhenitsyn won't be like, Solzhenitsyn, where's he from? Well, Russia, I mean, he was... No, I don't hear it. Vetoed. Some are complaining that this new label has led to an online harassment amid the post-9-11-like anti-Russia hysteria. This is all on top of all other drastic escalations in censorship which came roaring in at the beginning of the Ukraine war. For years, US lawmakers have been using threats of profit-destroying consequences to pressure Silicon Valley companies into limiting online speech in a way that aligns with the interests of Washington. And there I pause it for now because well, it goes on for quite a bit longer. His broadcasts are much like mine's or Jimmy Dore or others that go on for quite a while. There's so much stuff happening, you gotta shake your head, but that's not gonna change it. Not at all. And as Russell was talking about all these restrictions and banning and you're not thinking right, man. You know, it's not only about news and stuff. It's ballet, Russian, anything Russian, cultural, historic, anything Russian is now up for doing away with. And uh, how is that going to make the world a better place? Somebody who advocates for all this restriction, censorship, explain to me how that makes the world better for the next generation.